What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are back with Invincible. Now, here's the thing. I am trying my best to avoid spoilers in the titles. <laughs> I'm absolutely doing the best that I can to avoid spoilers. Granted, having spoilers is part of the super clickbait title scheme, but I'm avoiding it for Invincible because I don't want to ruin anything for you guys. Uh, so, this story does technically kick off with Sinclair. A lot of you guys remember him from the TV show where he was basically uh, making killer robots out of people. The way it plays out in the comics is almost identical to the way it plays out in the show. It just happens that a different point in time, right? Like this point where, where all the robots show up and people are being transformed, all that kind of stuff. That was a plot thread that was kind of being built on over the course of the comics and the time that Omni-Man was on Earth. When like the great big huge event happens and like Invincible learns that like these guys are being turned into robots, that happens after Omni-Man leaves. So again, just kind of a, a little bit of a difference between the show and the comics. It doesn't screw up the continuity because one of the cool things about Invincible is you do have like the main story and then you have like little smaller plot thread stories that kind of go, it kind of take place over the course of the, the comic itself itself, right? But what we end up doing here, you know, once Sinclair's caught, thrown in prison, he's met by uh, Cecil, right? And Cecil's kind of like, okay, like, if you accept our, our offer that we're going to give you, you will not go to jail, right? You won't face any kind of a char any charges, you won't have a criminal record or anything like that, like, you'll work for us, right? So a lot of the guys are kind of familiar with that already, but what you're not familiar with is when we switch over to Alan the Alien. Now, here's the cool thing. Alan the Alien is on the planet that's referred to as Telescria, which is the home of the Coalition of Planets. We'll talk a little bit more about them as we kind of get further into the comic book story. But what you end up doing here is picking up with Thaddeus, right? Now Thaddeus, of course, meets with Alan and then kind of has this conversation with him about how Alan's kind of growing and becoming stronger. And again, that's the nature of the character of Alan, right? We talked about that before, that the way his character was portrayed is that initially he was like an experiment, an attempt to create a race or to genetically modify a race that would basically put them on par with the Viltrumites in terms of strength and durability. The issue with this is that while Alan was super strong, there was nothing to indicate he was on the same level as the Viltrumites. But what we're learning here is that as time progresses, specifically in the aftermath of a battle and when he heals, that Alan's strength level right now is close to that of a Viltrumite if it's not directly on par with a Viltrumite. Now, we're not really given an absolute answer here. The explanation that we're given is that they're actually doing more tests and they're kind of exploring a little bit more to see where he's at. But by all standards of measurement, he's equal to the Viltrumites. And so while it's not necessarily a full army, it is certainly a winning move. The funny thing about this is the, the question that Alan has is how could you possibly know all this information about the Viltrumites, where are you getting all this information from? And a lot of it's just kind of chalked up to the fact that, that it's the coalition of worlds, right? It's a coalition of planets. They have just information all over the place. Instead, what Thaddeus reveals is that he's actually a Viltrumite, right? The Thaddeus was essentially the first of the Viltrumites to rebel against the Empire, to turn against them and to defect. Now, there is a much more significant story to Thaddeus than what we're given here, but essentially he just kind of establishes that he founded the coalition of planets to defend the universe against the evils of his own people, right? To basically face off against the Viltrumites and to, to really kind of slow them down as best he could. And a lot of that's rooted in the fact that he realized given the strength of the Viltrumites, you can't really kill them per se, or at least there was nobody else in the universe that seemed to be on the, the same level and capabilities as being able to kill the Viltrumites, right? They're just far too strong and far too capable. But for the longest time, Thaddeus thought he was the only person that was really able to stand against the Viltrumites outside of those individuals who were executed, right? Because he wasn't the only one. There were individuals who rebelled along with him, but in the end, they were all more or less killed. And so the question is, was there anybody else capable of doing that? And then Alan the Alien showed up with the story of Invincible. And that's when he realizes, even if Omni-Man is kind of defected and more or less taken up his role on a different world, in the end, both Omni-Man and Invincible can be swayed to the side of the Coalition of Worlds. And essentially, they can have a few Viltrumites on their side. Is it enough to win the war? Well, honestly, we'll have to wait until we get to the Viltrumite War story in order to find out. But one of the cool things that goes on here is you get this cool moment when you have Amber talking to her friends. Now, one of the things we've kind of discussed here is the relationship between Amber and Mark has largely been on the rocks, mostly because of the fact, and, and really only because of the fact, that with Mark being invincible and effectively being a guy who's a superhero, and he's really the, the first line of defense in protecting the world from the various threats that are there, that there's not really a whole lot of time for a relationship. And this really comes into fruition of the fact that he's always blowing her off, right? They're always out on dates and stuff like that, then he just gets up and leaves in the middle of it all. The reality is, despite the role that Mark plays, and while his role as a superhero is, in truth, more important than the relationship he has with Amber, she's feeling that lack of importance. And unlike Debbie, who of course marks mom and the, the wife of Omni-Man, that Amber can't really cope with it, right? Just one of these things where she's just kind of like, I mean, yeah, like talking to her friends, like I'm in love with Mark, I care about Mark. But the reality is she's been spending time with a friend of hers named Gary. Now Gary is, is a guy that she just kind of throws away, right? She's like, she's just a, he's a guy that I know. Yeah, he's funny. But like at the end of the day, like I'm in love with Mark, right? I'm not going to cheat on Mark. I'm not stepping out on him, you know, just to kind of get with this guy, Gary, because you guys see twinkles in my eyes and you guys have never 
never met Mark and you guys don't really understand why, that kind of a thing. But the reality of this, and this is what's kind of ironic, is you have this kind of situation where you, you kind of have to look at Mark for what he is, right? You have to look at him for, for the role that he plays. In the sense that, you know, that when the two, when Mark kind of shows up out of nowhere, and even when her friends are kind of talking to her about that, the reality is you kind of always have to ask yourself the question, like, what does this person bring to my life that makes them worthwhile? And at the same time, like, what would my life look like if I didn't have them? And it's an important thing to understand with Mark, because of the role that he plays and because of the power he has and his place in society, the reality is his life would not be bad without Amber, right? And it's just kind of one of these things where it's look, you look around, it's like, what would I lose if I didn't have you? I wouldn't, wouldn't lose anything. So, I mean, you can stay if you want to or go if you want to. In all honesty, I don't really care. And, and that lack of concern, I mean, Mark does care about her, but that lack of concern, which is really evidenced by the fact that he just takes off because he has some mission to go on or something like that is enough to kill the relationship. The real question to ask is, does it matter if it dies? And that's that's really the ultimate question when it comes to any relationship that you're in. If this relationship dies, does it matter? And if the answer to that question is no, well then that's only a reflection of one of two things. Either it means that you've more or less got your life sorted out and relationships are just not a necessity for you, which is perfectly fine. There are people that find a measure of happiness in their life by just traveling around and just doing things on their own. Or it may be that you just don't need to be in a relationship because you just don't care about people. So it really kind of depends on the situation. It is a little more nuanced than that, but it really kind of depends on the situation. But one of the other big things that kind of goes on here is we actually transition to Mars. Now, this is one of the big talking points here, one of the big moments, which was the sequence. A lot of you guys remember them, just kind of these little squid looking things with brains. They basically conquered Mars or, or kind of escaped and took over Mars. But we basically had this situation where in effect, the sequence have more or less kind of taken over everything, right? They just sort of spread all throughout, all over the place and are kind of forcing the... Uh, Martians to their will, right? Now there is a, a way in which this works and the, the whole idea behind the sequence is pretty cool here. But one of the things that happens is you basically switch over to the Martian himself. Now for those of you guys who don't really recall this, the way it played out is the, the astronaut that you see who's basically covered in the, the sequence, that's actually Russ, uh, Russ Livingston. The guy you see who initially was portraying Russ Livingston on Earth, that's the Martian. He's basically a shapeshifter. He calls himself the Shapesmith, which is a pretty cool name if I'm being honest with you guys. That's a pretty badass name. But the reality of this is he's kind of made a little bit of a home for himself among the guardians of the globe right and that's one of the funny things about the guardians is they are they seem to be far less discerning than traditional superhero teams if this was the justice league they would be like dude we don't know you right we're just not gonna let you on the team like that's ridiculous now some of this also has to do with the fact that the guardians of the globe are kind of desperate <laughs> <laughs> they need as much help as they can get, right? Because they're kind of reforming. You also get a cool moment where like the immortal is merely duplicate. Kind of a, a little bit of a side plot that was going on is the two of them were just kind of together for a little while. It pissed off Rex Splode when he walked in and found duplicate banging the immortal. And it's like, what did you expect, man, right? This guy is like, he's got experience. He's been around for a while. You're like an immature prick. What did you think was gonna happen, man? But the cool thing is that you kind of end up having Shapesmith who, who, who's kind of here and everybody's sort of talking. And then ultimately he just sort of reveals himself to Cecil, right? Because Cecil's basically talking about how like long range sensors and things like that are indicating that like a ship or some kind of a vehicle is headed straight for them and is coming from Mars. Now, while that's going on, you actually have Mark after his conversation with Amber, who takes over, takes off to Africa, meets with Adam Eve. And then while the two of them are kind of talking, bam, he kisses her, right? So it's just like, he doesn't quite know how to interpret that, right? Like, how do I interpret the fact that I just basically made out with like this smoking hot redheaded girl who I basically kind of like, but not, I'm not really willing to admit it. And so it was kind of cool to see that little bit of a romance blossoming there, kind of coming off the heels of Mark's previous experience when he was jumping through the future and talking to these, these various iterations of Eve. But then you basically have, you know, again, kind of jumping back to Cecil and them, Shapesmith is just kind of like, okay, so like, I really need to be honest with you guys. Um, I didn't get these powers that I have from like an unauthorized NASA experiment. Uh, basically I have these, these powers because everybody on my planet has them. I'm from Mars. And Cecil's like, what? But how can Cecil be mad? Cecil's probably the most inept government official ever, right? Cecil sucks at his job. And I feel like a simple phone call would have like confirmed this guy was lying through his teeth you know like Cecil's terrible at his job he's awful <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, he's pissed because he's like, okay. And I think more of it's like he's pissed at himself. But nonetheless, we basically end up getting this explanation from Shapesmith where he talks about the nature of the sequence. And what he basically says is that at some point along the line, at least the story that's been told year over year among the Martians, especially for the younger kids, so they're kind of aware of that history and legacy, is that you ended up having this race that kind of crash landed on Mars and that a massive war broke out that lasted, you know, nearly a century. Ultimately, the Martians came out on top only for them to realize, you know, as the battle 
battle sort of went on, that the conflict was not really with this alien race, but it was actually with the Sequids. That the Sequids themselves are really more of just like, you know, these, this kind of hive mind, but not really capable of anything beyond just simple movements and simple chores and, and, and you know, different things like that, right? Simple tasks. But when they bond to a host, they're capable of so much more. And that's when they realize, like, the main enemy is the Sequids. Like, these aliens, these blue aliens that showed up, they were just the host for the Sequids. Now, the desire is to expand themselves across the universe and to conquer world after world, so not that different from the Viltrumites just going about it by a different means. But because of the nature of the Martians, the Sequids couldn't bond to them. And so what the Martians did in turn is they actually used them as more or less a slave force. The problem with this is that the powers that be, right, the, the more or less government of the Martian group was actually going through and experimenting on them, performing these heinous acts, experimenting on the Sequids, different things like that, which in turn, the kind of re uh, rebels out there who had a sort of disdain for this realized it would lead to nothing but animosity. Because if the Sequids, after all this experimentation and all these kind of heinous uh, things that were done to them, if they successfully bonded themselves to a host, it would be revenge time. And that's exactly what happened. The NASA mission came to Mars, and anybody out there who basically arrives on Mars and is a potential host for the Sequids is immediately executed. Hence the reason why the, the astronauts were going to be killed. But ultimately, what ended up happening is the rebels realized the astronauts were there, and they basically forced or, or took Russ and exposed him to the Sequids, and then in turn, uh, Shavesmith took the place of Russ and then came back to Earth. And the idea behind this is that the Sequids would basically allow the rebels to kind of cast off the government, and the hopes is not necessarily they would live in unity, but that the, the Sequids would realize what the rebels had done, and then in turn say, okay, fine, we'll spare your world, and then just sort of move on. That's not what's going to happen. And in fact, Cecil's pissed. He's like, wait a minute, so you left an American citizen to be attacked by parasites on Mars? Like, that's what you did here? Really, man? Like, that's, that's, that's your whole thing? Okay, like, I'll deal with you later. I need to make some phone calls. And so ultimately, you end up having Mark and Adam Eve, who show up to the Guardians of the Globe base of operations, being summoned there by Cecil, and Cecil's like, okay, so like, we're all basically gonna get together, right? Like, we're gonna, like, we're gonna go to Mars. The only ones who are basically gonna stay behind are gonna be Rexplo, Duplicate, and Shrinking Ray, which is kind of funny, because Shrinking Ray's like, man, I get sidelined, but it's like, look, man, I mean, all you can do is shrink, right? I mean, they'll find you anyway, right? They'll seek you out. I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do, but basically, you get Robot, Monster Girl, the Immortal, Bulletproof, and Black Samson, who all end up going out there for this mission, right? And of course, you end up having uh, Immortal and, and Adam Eve, who go there as well. Now, while this goes on, you have Mark, who leaves a message for Amber, and is just being, like, super, super ambiguous, right? Like, you know, there's nothing I can do, Amber. I have to go, Amber, right? There's, there's, you know, they need me. And, like, ultimately, she's pissed off because she got a call yet again from Mark that, like, he's going to blow her off. I mean, the reality is, even if Mark really is a superhero, he's kind of being a dick. And so, ultimately, Amber does exactly what you would expect in the most predictable way ever, and she calls Gary as, quote-unquote, a shoulder to cry on. Now, let me tell you something, guys. Any woman out there who's having struggles with her boyfriend and then calls up another guy and says, like, I just need a shoulder to cry on, they're probably going to end up banging. That's just the way it goes, right? That's just that's just the way it is. And so ultimately, you end up having this, this kind of crazy thing where once they're on their way to Mars, the question's kind of asked, like, what weapons do we have on this ship? Because we are getting ready to fly towards, like, a, a, a like literally a giant spaceship that's making its way to Earth with the intention of conquering it. And it's like, dude, this is a space shuttle, man. This thing is literally the equivalent of, like, a space version of a city bus. There's no weapons here, man. When was the last time that you saw, like, laser beams on the side of a city bus? Although, admittedly, that'd be cool as hell, man. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if, like, Killdozer had laser beams on it. That would be nuts. Nonetheless, like, rockets get fired, the ship blows up, Kate saves everybody, right? Like, literally just creates a force field and saves everybody. This is kind of a cool moment, but you also get a little realism here. One of the big questions you always had to ask whenever, like, the Green Lanterns were like, okay, guys, we're gonna fly to the other side of the known universe, let's all make our green bubbles and just go there, is, like, what do they do for oxygen? And, like, literally, you... <laughs> <laughs> Literally, people in there are like, we can't breathe! <laughs> We're running out of air! <laughs> So I love that little bit of realism that goes on there because it's like, I mean, this is a great idea, but like we need air to breathe and there's no air in space and we're running out of air here. So uh, we need to do something. Now, of course, they end up getting aboard the ship, but as soon as they do, you kind of have the rebels who are in the engine room trying to find some way to overcome this whole situation. Now, ultimately, one of the guys are just kind of like, hey, I found a squid. And, like they smash it and it's like, no, they have a hive mind. They're all going to know you're here now, right? Like if you'd left it alone, it wouldn't have known. But now that you've done something, they're all like, they're all going to know and 
literally they all just come pouring in. And so at that point, there's a few things that go on that I kind of want to talk about here. The first is that back on Earth, you ended up having this kind of crazy lizard organization, right? Just these crazy guys. They're more or less modeled after the Serpent Society from the Captain America comics, but they've more or less taken control of like a nuclear base with the intent of just unleashing absolute hell and just kind of showing that like they're, they're a force to be reckoned with. And so you end up having like those who are left behind, right? So like Rexplode, Duplicate, Shrinking Ray, who all basically, you know, kind of jump into the attack and, and take these guys out. Duplicate is just totally obliterated, right? Like Duplicate's killed and she's, she's just like smashed and ripped to pieces, right? Like all the versions of her are just like ripped apart, just killed. And so Duplicate's gone, right? After that, like Rexplode gets shot in the head. He survives, but he gets shot in the head and it's just kind of like, damn, right? Now, more or less the, the day's kind of saved after that minus the death of Duplicate, which, you know, I guess it, maybe it's kind of, you know, crappy of me to kind of skim over her death, but I mean, you know, come on, a girl that can make copies of herself, not the most impressive character ever in the history of comic books. I'm just saying, she's hardly relevant to the story. But nonetheless, as far as everybody else goes, right, back in space, that while Adam Eve is doing everything she can to hold this force field, and you've got Robot, who essentially managed to find a way to temporarily disrupt the hive mind of the, uh, of the sequence, it only lasted for a minute or two. And so what he's more or less doing is trying to work on a way to actually amplify it and to make it more powerful so we can shut them all down for quite some time, right? Just knock them out as opposed to just kind of daze them and just kind of shock them like, man, what was that, right? That kind of a thing. The problem is that Adam Eve can't quite hold her power in the way that she needs to in order to keep everybody protected. Now, this is simply just the learning process, right? This is one of the ways in which, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with comics, this is how you see characters grow, right? That their powers are usually pushed in extreme situations, whether it's agility or something like that, or in the case of Adam Eve, trying to hold up a, a, a I guess, a molecularly structured force field as long as she possibly can. Her powers just aren't quite on that level yet to do it for a lengthy, meaningful amount of time. And so what you end up getting here is kind of Russ Livingston just kind of going nuts and rambling about how like they can't be stopped, you know, and they're ultra powerful and they're going to conquer all of known existence and so on, you know, so on and so forth. Like you end up having Immortal who sort of jumps into the fray and starts, you know, literally going against this guy as best he can, as well as like all the different sequins who were there. And then Shadesmith has this genius idea, right? Where he's like, okay, if we have to protect this guy, then I'll just cover everybody. And that's what he does. He basically covers the covers Robot literally as best he can because he cannot be infected by the by the sequence, right? He can't be turned. He can't be forced into one of their own. And so he literally just forms a giant ball around this guy while everybody else fights the sequence off. And then suddenly he hears Robot basically saying like, I've done it, I've fixed it. And so initially Immortal takes it to go and use it. But the biggest problem Immortal has, and it's one of the things that Invincible seems to hit up on, his ego seems to come into play. That Immortal is an exceedingly proud character. A lot of it's because he sees himself as somebody who's been around for a very long time, the guy who is the leader of the Guardians of the Globe in his previous form, therefore he should be the leader now. But the truth about this, and Mark makes a good point, he's like, I'm faster than you, I'm stronger than you. This is too important for your ego to get in the way. The reality is that if anybody should be doing this, it should be me. And so ultimately, because of the fact that, that Invincible can move faster than the sequence can counter, which Immortal doesn't seem to be on that level, he just runs up on Russ Livingston and activates the beacon and all the sequence get knocked out. From there, he basically snatches up Russ and is just kind of like, okay, cool. We've basically saved the day. These guys are knocked out. There's no more hosts. So they're just going to go back to doing, you know, uh, regular meaningless tasks according to, you know, the, the Martian Empire. And that'll more or less be it. But the problem is the Martians don't want to let Shapesmith go because at the end of the day, he more or less is the one that caused all this, right? He's the reason why all this happened when he body swapped with Russ Livingston and allowed Russ Livingston to be taken over by the sequence. The problem is that they're going to execute him. And so like, the Guardians are just like, no, that ain't going to happen. So they basically snatch him up and just fly into space as fast as they can. <laughs> they take off as quick as they possibly can. Now, one of the other things that kind of goes on here, you kind of get a little bit of a follow-up to some of the things that we've seen over the course of the story so far. And so one of the first things that happens here is you basically have Mark and everybody getting back to Earth and you have a little bit of a discussion between Adam, Eve, and Mark and they don't really know where this is going insofar as the fact that they kissed, do they have feelings for each other? Mark isn't really sure. He's just kind of like, I don't know if I really have feelings for it all. And even if he does, there's a few things he needs to resolve. And then he gets to Amber's place and Gary's in there, right? Like Gary's in her room and and like he's overhearing this conversation they're having where he's like I mean you know it was, it was a good movie Amber you know I had a great time you know and, and that's the thing she's like well I mean it was cool but like I have a boyfriend and then Gary plays a smart move right I hear about your boyfriend a lot like where, where you know where is he where exactly is your boyfriend at and she's like well I don't really know and he's like and where am I and she's like you're here right like you're right here now under normal circumstances that never would have worked right she's like she would have she would have been like man come on and like probably would have kicked him out but giving the vulnerable position that she's in it works right like it, he's, he's able to pull it off Gary read her like a book and was just kind of like, bam, 
right? Like, like as, as soon as, as soon as, like she says, like you're here and he touches her hand, boom, he's in, right? Like that door, it's, it's not a foot in the door anymore, right? That door's, that door's blown wide open, blown off the hinges, right? Like, like, it's like that guy is gonna be nailing Amber in no time. And so, so Mark's just kind of like, okay, right? Seeing this whole thing unfold, he actually does really what he should do here, right? Which is going to her and saying, look, like it's over, right? Like, I mean, there, there's no reason for us to date anymore. Now he kind of falls on his sword here, which I don't really agree with, where he's kind of like, you know, I mean, you know, I really haven't been the best boyfriend, which is true. He hasn't really been a, be been a great boyfriend or anything like that. But the reality is people date according to their station in life. And the truth about this is that Mark dating Amber, that ain't gonna work because Amber just, it's, she's not on Mark's level, right? I mean, Mark's literally a protector of the world. He's, he's got all these capabilities going for him. Adam Eve is a much better match for Mark than Amber is, right? Because Adam Eve is on Mark's level. Actually, she's a little higher than him because she's more powerful than he is. But nonetheless, right? I mean, like she is, she's more or less equal to him on a societal level. And so that's why, that's why it's going to work, right? That's, that's why, like, it's kind of like those two need to be the ones who get together. Amber, you know, ultimately when he tells her everything that it's just kind of like, I mean, it was cool when we first got together and I first told you I was invincible. And then you were like, yeah, I'm banging a superhero, right? Like it was kind of cool and everything, but now that we're really in the thick of it, right? And we're kind of at that point where it's like, where's this really going, right? You know, ultimately it's like, I can't be the kind of boyfriend that you need, honestly, because I got more important things to worry about. <laughs> and so ultimately, you know, the, like he breaks up with her and she's kind of like, yeah, I mean, I was going to break up with you, but I'm glad you did it first, you know? So like ultimately they just kind of stay friends and they go their separate ways. And you kind of have this little bit of a, of a mourning moment with the immortal where he loses duplicate. Now, this is a big thing. Like after they'd had the whole funeral for duplicate with the immortal, it sucks, right? And this is actually a great moment for his character because the immortal has been around for a long, long time. And it's one of these things where he, and it almost kind of contrasts what's going on with Mark, right? In the sense that with the immortal having this conversation and just kind of like, yeah, you know, like it's nothing that I haven't been through before. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing that I'm not used to at the end. It's just like, you know, she was, she was so young, right? And, and I didn't know that I'd lose her so soon. And that's kind of the crazy thing. It's an expectation. The immortal has lived for a pretty lengthy amount of time and he's been in love and he's lost them. Oftentimes he's had to outlive them, different things like that. But at the end of the day, duplicate was young. And, and despite the fact that he's been through this time and time again, he was genuinely in love with her. And he was hoping that even though he would ultimately outlive her, presumably outlive her, assuming that her power kept her for, didn't keep her from aging, that at the end of the day, they'd have a pretty long and healthy life together, likely having kids, different things like that. And then suddenly she was gone. Not only was she gone, he wasn't there. He wasn't there to protect her. He wasn't there to, to keep her safe. And so it was kind of a crazy situation because it's like, you know, there's a lot of regret there. A lot of things that he wished he'd done with regards to, to duplicate. Now, the truth is they hadn't been together for all that long. And so there wasn't really a whole lot of time for, for him to have been able to do those things in the first place. So the reality is it's more or less him just kind of desiring and mourning the future they could have had as opposed to the time they had, which the future they could have had could have been could have been fantastic. And so following that, you basically pick up with Russ Livingston returning home and his life is more or less going back to normal to a degree in the sense that he was offered his old job back at NASA, different things along those lines. After going through some testing and, and so on and so forth, he's kind of able to turn back to return back to normal. But as soon as he gets home, he starts coughing like crazy. And the reason for this is he starts coughing up sequins. They literally embedded themselves inside of his body. They bond themselves to, to Russ and they're like, it's only a matter of time before we conquer the world. <laughs> Certainly the most corny ending, corny ending ever to a comic, but amazing nonetheless. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.